Biology is the scientific study of life. So how do we study it? We have lots of tools to help us, but they are all worthless without you. As a biologist and scientist, you must not only learn how to utilize all the cool tools, but also how to analyze the information these tools help you collect. In the end, we are trying to learn more about ourselves and the world around us. There are a couple of ways we can do this. We can study science by the discovery method, in which we observe and collect data and later analyze it. We have no initial concept, which is called a hypothesis, that we want to test for. This is a common way researchers study biology in the field. Also called descriptive science, discovery science allows scientists to use inductive reasoning to make conclusions based on observations. Jane Goodall, an expert on chimpanzees and other apes, has conducted most of her research this way. This type of research can lead to hypothesis testing. We can also study life by testing hypotheses. This type of research is commonly done in a laboratory setting, where all factors in the experiment can be controlled. First, we generate a hypothesis, which is a possible explanation to the question we have about the subject. Then we perform an experiment to test our hypothesis. We must analyze the data collected to determine if our hypothesis was correct or not. In hypothesis testing, scientists use deductive reasoning to predict the results of an experiment based on logical assumptions. The cause of cystic fibrosis was determined by this type of research. Cystic fibrosis is caused by the buildup of excess mucus in the lungs and digestive system, leading to respiratory problems and organ failure. Scientists determined through testing that this disease occurred because of a mutation in the gene that determines the viscosity or thickness of mucus secreted by the cell. Hypothesis testing is accomplished through the scientific method. The basic steps of the scientific method are observation of a phenomenon, asking a question about the phenomenon, forming a hypothesis based on the question, experimentation and collection of data, analyzing the data, and exception or rejection of the hypothesis. The hypothesis can be revised if necessary. And you do need to report your findings to the scientific community. Let's go through these steps with an example. You eat an ice cream cone rather quickly and observe that you get a splitting headache. Why did you get the headache? Let's answer that question to form our hypothesis. Hmm, there must be something about ice cream that causes a headache. But is that a good hypothesis? Let's check. A good hypothesis must be testable, meaning you can test it. Can we test something? No, we have to be more specific. A good hypothesis must be repeatable, meaning you need to be able to test the hypothesis many times. Also, other researchers must be able to test your hypothesis. And a good hypothesis must be falsifiable. I know it doesn't sound like a real word, but this means you have to have the ability to prove your hypothesis to be false. Consider the hypothesis, aliens live on a planet a thousand light years from Earth. Can you gather evidence to show that these aliens do not exist? No, because we don't have the technology to do this and the scientific method cannot test this because it is not falsifiable. So, what hypothesis would answer our question about something in ice cream causing headaches and be testable and be repeatable and be falsifiable? What is a characteristic about ice cream we can test? Temperature, did you say? Okay. So let's give a tentative explanation. It is the temperature of ice cream that causes the ice cream headache. Now it's time to make a prediction based on our hypothesis. So, if we are correct about our hypothesis, then we must be able to link the cold temperature of the ice cream to the ice cream headache. How can we do that? It seems simple, right? Just get some people to eat ice cream and they should get a headache. Okay, start eating. They all got headaches. I'm right. But am I? 
Does that really test the temperature? No. Why not? Oh, yes. It could be something else in the ice cream, not just the temperature. Okay, so what do we do? We need more groups of people to test to make sure it is the temperature, not just something else about the ice cream that causes headaches. So we can't use only regular ice cream. What else can we use to make sure it's the temperature? That's it, melted ice cream. If the only thing different is the temperature, then only those who eat the frozen ice cream should get the headache. So our ice cream is a variable in our experiment because it can be changed. And it is specifically called the independent variable, as we are directly altering this variable, frozen or melted ice cream. There's another variable called the dependent variable. If we change the independent variable, the dependent variable will change as well. But we cannot directly change the dependent variable. What do you think the dependent variable is in our experiment? The headache. Per our hypothesis, if we used melted ice cream, there should be no headache. But if we use frozen ice cream, there should be a headache. So, the headache variable depends upon the ice cream variable. Now, all the other variables in the experiment need to be the same. So when our two different groups are tested, the lighting needs to be the same, the temperature needs to be the same, the noise level needs to be the same, even the chairs and tables need to be the same. Why? Well, we want to test for just the ice cream, right? Could any of these other factors affect our results? Yes! So all the other factors must be controlled so that they are as similar as possible. And now, we are finally ready to set up our experiment. Okay, here's our test subjects. Let's randomly divide them into two groups. Let's give these guys frozen ice cream. They are called the experimental group, as they are testing our hypothesis, which is based on the temperature of the ice cream. And these guys get the melted ice cream. They are called the control group, as they are not testing for the hypothesis, but to make sure that no other factor is affecting our results. Okay, let's give them their treatments. Okay, let's wait and see who gets a headache. Oh, five out of six subjects who ate frozen ice cream got a headache. Now it is time to analyze our results. A whopping 83% of those who ate frozen ice cream developed headaches, while none of those who ate the melted ice cream did. So what's next? Ah, we need to make a conclusion. Should we accept or reject our hypothesis? Please keep in mind, we can only reject or support hypotheses. We cannot prove them. The word prove in science means that it will happen 100% of the time, and we cannot perform enough tests to show a hypothesis is always correct. But the more tests we perform, the more certain we can be about our hypothesis. Since such a large percentage of our experimental group got headaches, this supports our hypothesis that the headache is linked to the temperature of the frozen ice cream. And the more experiments we perform that support our hypothesis, the more certain we are that those brain freeze headaches are linked to the temperature of the frozen ice cream. Now, the more a hypothesis is supported, the more certain we are that it is true, and a hypothesis can be elevated to the theory status. There are few theories in biology, but the best known are the cell theory, and the theory of evolution.